Hi, and welcome back to your autism game plan. I'm Joya Vanderlaan, a family nurse practitioner, a functional medicine specialist, and an autism mom. I've had a lot of questions recently about SIBO, or small intestine bacterial overgrowth. What is it? How is it diagnosed? How do we deal with it? What symptoms does it cause? Uh, along with that goes CIFO, which is kind of a newer term, which is the same except stands for small intestinal fungal overgrowth instead of bacterial overgrowth. So today we're going to go over the basics of SIBO and CIFO. In order to understand SIBO and CIFO, we need to understand the anatomy, the order of the digestive system. So first, of course, it starts with our mouth. We chew in there, goes down the esophagus to our stomach. From there, it enters the small intestine, which is separated into three different parts, and then the large intestine or colon, and then it gets excreted. So usually there are many, many, many more bacteria in the large intestine than there are in the small intestine. That's the way it's meant to be. That's the way it should be. There's a little valve at the junction of the small and large intestine that prevents backflow of material into the small intestine from the large intestine. Sometimes what happens though is material is allowed to backflow and the small intestine then gets colonized or populated with bacteria, fungi that should not be there, which then leads to this condition of SIBO or SIFO. In terms of symptoms of SIBO or SIFO, the first and most common symptom that I often think about is bloating. It can be generalized abdominal bloating. It can seem to be more upper or lower, depending on what type of infection and where the overgrowth is happening. There can also be diarrhea or constipation. There can be sensitivity to foods, skin rashes. It can even trigger some autoimmune conditions. So there's a lot of different symptoms of SIBO, some of which can cause our children pain, right? The other thing that happens with SIBO is that pro propionic acid is kind of a byproduct of a lot of the bacteria that are the cause of SIFO and SIBO. And so what happens is that propionic acid is very high in kiddos with, in anybody, with SIBO. And it's been found actually that up to 80% of autistic kids have high levels of this propionic acid. And so that kind of makes us wonder, well, right, is SIBO related to autism? in any way? And the answer is maybe, it could be, and it could be in your child. There are a few different ways to test for SIBO or CIFO. One, probably the most common one, is the breath test, and that can be done at home. Very often though, it's really hard for kids to follow the pre-test instructions and to blow into this bag apparatus the way they're supposed to. And so oftentimes what I'll do is either do an oat which is a urine test, organic acid test, which is helpful for a lot of other things as well. It gives us a lot of clues as to what's going on in the child's gut and with their metabolism and detoxification, all sorts of things. Or I might do a stool test. So, and both of those are very easy to collect, urine or stool, especially if the child is continent. Even if they're wearing a diaper, the stool test might be a little easier to collect. So it kind of goes patient by patient. But those are three methods that we can use to test for SIBO or SIFO. So in terms of treating SIBO, I want to give you three simple things that you can do at home without the supervision or prescriptions of a provider. The first is inulin, not insulin, not inositol, uh, but inulin. It's a prebiotic fiber and it actually feeds the good bugs in the intestines um, and helps to reduce that propionic acid uh, I was talking about earlier. So inulin. The next is omega-3 fatty acids or fish oils or EPA, DHA, you might hear them called. So in full script, I've put both inulin and a couple options for omega-3 fatty acids, that EPA, DHA, fish oil type of supplement. Those two things can be really helpful. Check over on the link for dosing and things like that. The third thing is olive oil. Interestingly, olive oil is really high in omega-9 fatty acids. We want to have a good balance between omega-3, 6, 9, and the omega-9 the omega found in olive oil can help contribute to that balance. Remember though, it's not a good idea to cook, especially at high temperatures, with olive oil. So the way I usually get olive oil into kids' diets is by adding it on top of maybe vegetables after they're cooked or into soups or even stir it into applesauce. 
there are lots of ways that you can try and sneak in oils for your kids. And of course, we can't talk about SIBO or SIFO without talking a little bit about diet. The one general rule of thumb is don't feed your kids a whole lot of carbs, especially not the sugars, uh, you know, the sugary treats and snacks. Um, fruits are okay, vegetables are awesome, but a lot of the foods that our kids crave and love are gluten and sugar, right? And a lot, a lot of times dairy as well. So just watch the sugar carb content and focus more on protein and produce and getting those good fats in. As always, thanks for watching and thanks for your questions. I hope to be answering many more of those in the coming weeks. And remember, be gentle with yourself. You are doing a great job.